Now we come to Isaiah. Whoa, we come to the prophets. What can you say about Isaiah? That's an amazing book. Uh, maybe it's the greatest book in the Old Testament. Um, I want to mention here a new book out on Isaiah, which I just finished. Maybe you've seen it, uh, by Andrew Abernathy, an Old Testament scholar from Australia. But I think he's teaching at Wheaton now, but he's Australian. The Book of Isaiah and God's Kingdom, which is in the New Studies of Biblical Theology series. All those books with the gray cover, edited by Don Carson. So uh, the book by Morales uh, on Leviticus is in the same series. So that, that series is really excellent. Um, by the way, uh, Jim Hamilton has a book in that series on Daniel. So uh, this is a fascinating book, and he, he emphasizes, I like this book because it came out after mine, of course, because it just came out, and he emphasizes that one of the main themes of Isaiah is the kingdom. Oh, he's a wise person, isn't he? <laughs> so anyway, so, um, so many things we could talk about on Isaiah, we, we, but just hit some high points and... Obviously, God's, God's judgment of Israel is a major theme. In chapters 1 through 37, if you looked at the book as a whole, chapters 1 through 37 focus on Assyria, right, the Assyrian kingdom, and Israel, and especially Jerusalem. So remember the Assyrian Empire, if you know your history, the Assyrian Empire captured the northern kingdom and put it in exile in 722 B.C. And it took over almost all of Judah and was besieging Jerusalem, but did not succeed. Right? So that's the big picture. 185,000 were slain by the Lord as they were outside the city, and then they left. And Isaiah's all about, you know, the, the, the main point of the first 37 chapters is... Um, Jerusalem will be spared despite Israel's sin. But of course, the, 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 the Jerusalem was spared, but the country as a whole was devastated by Assyria as it, you know, as it was taking city after city and, and coming up, as Isaiah says, coming up to the neck. You remember that image? Coming up to the neck of uh, the land and, and the, neck, the head's the capital, right? So it almost, it almost took the whole country. The punishments are covenantal, Leviticus 26, 27, and 28. I like what Abernathy says about Israel's sin. Israel is stupider than a donkey. A pro it's a prostitute. They're God's enemies, and it's a vineyard-producing putrid grapes. So that's why the judgment uh, came. Abernathy especially emphasizes Hebrews... Uh, Hebrews. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, where, where you have the throne room vision, right? That, that great, great chapter of Yahweh, he has a vision, right? And the year King Uzziah died, he has a vision of Yahweh in the temple. The vision of Yahweh in the temple is Yahweh is king, right? He's the king in the temple. And the hem of his robe signifies his royal authority. He sits on the throne, he's He's the, he's the holy one. Again, Abernathy says, the smoke in the temple connotes God's theophanic presence, per, perhaps even his anger at his people. Um, and he also argues that the seraphim being present there signify God's judgment on, on his people. So no wonder, no wonder um, Isaiah speaking of himself, but representing the nation, says, woe is me, with the, the, the great holiness of God. In terms of canonical links, it's most interesting, isn't it, that John argues that what Isaiah, Isaiah saw Jesus, right? He saw, he saw Jesus' glory. Clearly, he has to be talking about Isaiah chapter 6. So, so we see... Uh, uh, so we see clearly in John that the, the, the revelation of Yahweh is also the revelation of Jesus. 
I, I don't think the conclusion is he didn't see Yahweh, but he saw Jesus. I think the conclusion is uh, fundamentally Trinitarian, isn't it? At the end of the day, when you see God, you see the Lord. So again and again and again in the New Testament, curios passages, passages about Yahweh are applied to Jesus Christ. And uh, we see John do that. So we see, we see much about uh, Israel's evil. I'm, you know, I'm not focusing on that because I want to look at a couple passages because I think the hermeneutical passages will be interesting to look at. We see the day of the Lord is one of judgment and salvation. Um, day, of the, day of the Lord is a huge theme in the prophets, right? Chapters 24 through 27, those are important chapters, aren't they? They focus on universal judgment. Chapter 34, the judgment of Edom. Edom sort of represents all the ungodly nations. But God will judge. So I, I want to come back to that, at least some of the passages. Ju so th that's just very general. Jerusalem's salvation will be through the king. So Jerusalem will be spared even though she's a whore. Quite remarkable. I already mentioned Assyria coming up to the neck. But let's, so let's dip down a little bit. And this is a controversial passage. People go different ways. Let's go into Isaiah chapter 7 and 8. Because I want to do, so I'm, I'm doing a little bit of Matthew here at the same time, okay? I'll do a little bit of Matthew and Isaiah because it's helpful to do it when we're looking at the Old Testament passage. And this is where we see biblical theology at work. Of course, Matthew argues that you see the fulfillment in the birth of the virgin. So you see, the king is Ahaz, and uh, Ahaz is an uh, evil king. Um, so Aram and, and Ephraim together were conspiring against Ahaz. So Aram, let's just say for Aram, Aram is Syria, right? Ephraim is the northern kingdom, and they're conspiring against Judah, and the people are terrified, verse 2. Isaiah goes out with his son, the remnant shall return. That's what his name means, right? And, and uh, he says, don't worry. Don't worry about the leaders, Razin of Aram, of Syria, and the son of Ramalia, Pekah, who's the leader in Israel, don't worry about them. They've plotted against you. They say they're going to go up to Judah and put in Tabil's son as king. They say, Ahaz, they're going to displace you as the ruler. But the Lord says it's not going to happen. The chief of Aram is Damascus. So Damascus is the capital city of Syria. Uh, the chief city of Damascus is Razin, Within 56, 65 years, Ephraim too will, will be too shattered to be a people. So the, the basic point is, right, Israel and Syria will be destroyed by, by whom? Well, by Assyria, right? Don't worry about them taking over you, Judah, because I'm going to judge them. But remember, the people are terrified. They're terrified about this threat. So then the Lord says to Ahaz, ask for a sign from the Lord your God. It can be a deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz replied, I will not ask and I will not test the Lord. That sounds very spiritual, doesn't it? No, 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 I'm not going to. I don't need a sign. I'm just fine. I'm just fine. But it's clearly from unbelief. How do we know that from the subsequent word, right? I mean, if, I was, if you're reading that out of context, you might say, Oh, how wonderful Ahaz is. He doesn't need to see a sign. Even, even, uh, even Jesus himself would commend him for that, right? No. Isaiah said, listen, house of David, is it not enough for you to try the patience of men? Will you also try the patience of God? God's not pleased. <laughs> God is not pleased at all with what Ahaz does. Ahaz is the wicked king. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Okay. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel, God with us. So that's, that's the prophecy. By the time, now, so here we go. 
I can predict that not all of you are going to agree with what I'm about to say. So, but I'm, that's why I want to look at this. We can have some good conversation, maybe. By the time he learns to reject what is bad and choose what is good, he will be eating curds and honey. Now, who's he talking about? The son talked about here, right? He'll have a son and name him Emmanuel. By the time he knows the difference between good and bad, he'll be eating curds and honey. Okay. What's that mean? Well, we have to keep reading. For before the boy knows how to reject what is bad and choose what is good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. This, this, um, before this boy is old enough to tell the difference between good and bad, Syria and Israel, the northern kingdom, Ephraim, will be destroyed. So my, my argument is, given what this prophecy is, this prophecy is fulfilled in Isaiah's day. That's the normal, I am reading the text in its Old Testament context. Now, I'm not done yet. The Lord will bring on you, your people, and your father's house, such a time as has never been since Ephraim separated from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. So I'm not making this up, right? The judgment is coming from Assyria. On that day, so he's saying to Ahaz, don't worry. He's saying to Ahaz and Judah, don't worry, God is with you. Here's the sign. A son's going to be born. Before that son's even old enough to know right from wrong, Assyria is going to sweep down and take Syria, Aram, and Israel, and your threat will be gone. Of course, now you'll have to worry about Assyria. But that's, another word. that's another story. On that day, the Lord will whistle to flies at the farthest streams of the Nile and to bees in the land of Assyria. Now, He's, he's speaking of the enemies that will come, right? The Assyrians are going to be like, like bees that the Lord invites to come. They'll come and settle in the steep ravines and the clefts of the rocks and the thorn bushes and in all the water holes. They're going to come and invade your land like insects, like bees that are everywhere. That's talking about the Assyrians. Even when he says the Nile, I think he still has in mind the Assyrians. I think he's just using imagery of a foreign nation there. Now this thing's really wanting to fall off here. It's pulling at me anyway. On that day, the Lord will use a razor. So, you know, he keeps saying the same thing over and over again. It's, is it not working very well? Because I've been adjusting it so much. Yeah. I think it's okay. I can bring it back. Is that better? Is it, or do I need to pull it in more? Is that okay? Is that good enough? Mm. Bring that in. Um, how's that? Okay. Okay. On that day, the Lord will use a razor hired from beyond the Euphrates River, the king of Assyria. So here we are again. To shave the, the beautiful image, right? to shave the hair on your heads, the hair on your legs, and even your beards. So it's going to be a shaving operation, right? The judgment's compared to shaving. He's going to shave all your hair off. <laughs> so what's going to happen? On that day, a man will raise a young cow and two sheep, and from the abundant milk they give, he will eat curds, for every survivor in the land will eat curds and honey. Aha! Uh -huh. Right? Remember what we read? By the time that young boy that's born learns to reject the bad and choose what is good, he will be eating curds and honey. Well, there it is. How soon is the judgment coming? Or what will happen when the judgment comes? When Assyria comes, what people will eat are curds and honey. On that day, notice he keeps repeating on that day, every place where there are a thousand vines worth a thousand pieces of silver will become thorns and briars. A man will go there with bow and arrows because the whole land will be thorns and briars. You will not go to all the hills that were once tilled with the hoe for fear of thorns and briars. Those hills will be places for oxen to graze and for sheep to trample. In other words, the vineyards are going to be gone. The vineyards are going to be gone. What is there going to be left to eat? 
curds and honey. The vineyards are going to be destroyed. Then the Lord said to me, take a large piece of parchment and write on it with an ordinary pen, Maher Shalal Hash Baz. Nice name, right? Uh, uh, what, swift is the punishment, swift is the prey, it means. So his name stands for the punishment coming. I have appointed trustworthy witnesses, the priests Uriah and Zechariah, son of Jeberechiah. I was then intimate with the prophetess, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. The Lord said to him, name him Maher Shalel Hashbaz. I believe that this child is the fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 4, 7, 14. So a child is born very quickly to a young maiden, right? And it's this boy. For before the boy, I think it fits with chapter 7, before the boy knows how to call father or mother, before he knows the difference between right and wrong, the wealth of Damascus and the spoils of Samaria will be carried off to the king of Assyria. So these things will be fulfilled. And then he says again, the Lord will bring against them the mighty rushing water of the Euphrates River, the king of Assyria in all his glory. It will overflow its channels. Here's another image of the judgment. It's like a river overflowing its channels, spilling over its banks. It'll pour even into Judah. It'll even come up into your neck. It'll fill your entire land, Emmanuel. But God is with us and Jerusalem won't be taken. So he says, God's with us, Emmanuel. Don't call a conspiracy what these people call a conspiracy. Don't worry about, don't worry about Ephraim and Syria. Don't fear what they fear. Fear the Lord. And so forth and so on. So that's my take on what Isaiah had in mind. That, that the prophecy was fulfilled in his day. But why does Matthew appropriate this prophecy then? Uh, and I think we're going to see other examples of this in Matthew. Not all of Matthew's prophecies are straight-line prophecies. You know, I know most evangelicals take this as just a straight-line prophecy and not being fulfilled at all in Isaiah's day. And, of course, that, that's possible, isn't it? It's possible it is a straight-line prophecy. But I think it's unlikely, given the, the flow of thought in Isaiah chapters 7 and 8. I think the problem with that reading is I don't think it accords well with the Old Testament context itself. So how do we explain what Matthew is doing? Uh, we'll return to this when we come to Matthew again, how Matthew appropriates the Old Testament, but I would argue that Matthew argues typologically. Matthew finds a typological relationship between a God, God's promise in history and the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And when you have typology, there's escalation. So there's a pattern and a correspondence. There will be a son who is born, but this son will not just be born to a maiden, but this word can also mean virgin, right? This son will be born to a virgin. And so there, there will be a greater birth and a greater fulfillment and a greater sign. I would argue that for Matthew, that's part of the way prophecy functions. Prophecy isn't only, in Matthew, a straight line prediction, but it also, prophetic passages are typological. So, there you have it. Anything you want to say about that? Any questions, comments? I'll show you other examples of this in Matthew when we come to Matthew. Some professor said the same thing, but I think he actually went a step farther and said that all prophecies in the prophets were had a partial fulfillment during their time. What do you think of? What about the birth of uh, the, the promise of Bethlehem? The, the, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. How is that partially fulfilled? Uh, I don't know. He, like, he, he made this statement, but uh, he, made, he might not have made, said all of the prophets. But, he said, yeah. He said, he said a large chunk of all the prophets. Okay, so he basically agreed with my interpretation. <laughs> he also signed your name, so. Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe that's not controversial. Good. Yeah. So the uh, virgin in Isaiah 7, 
should be correctly translated as maiden, not as actual literal virgin. No, I, I actually think it does mean maiden here. But 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 I, but the word can also mean virgin, right? Parthenos. You're right, right. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 it's a matter of ultimately a both end because a maiden can be a virgin, right? So there's a, there's room in the meaning of the word for both readings, I think. The semantic range of that word is such that so translating it virgin isn't so much wrong, but in the particular context, I think he has in mind to make. Yeah. Anything else there? So one example in Isaiah that we're looking at, uh, a huge theme in Isaiah is the remnant, right? Um, the remnant, the remnant, I would argue, is represented in the king. So this is very important as well. The, the judgment is coming, Isaiah 6, but the holy seed is the stump. So, you know, basically the, the whole country is cut down. But all that's left is a stump. But I would argue for Isaiah, I mean, the remnant, a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse. The remnant focuses on a king, particularly. A branch from its roots will bear fruit. It looks like if it's, as if it's the end. Now, I'm not saying in Isaiah the only person left is the king. I mean, you have Isaiah and his children and so forth and so on. But the remnant centers on, for Isaiah, the, 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 the promise of the remnant centers on the king himself, finally. So I think that's very important. So, of course, we have Isaiah 9, right? So there's a new David, there's a king coming. You know, I give some of these passages. You see the branch of the Lord is coming, so forth and so on. You see in chapter 9, 2 through 7, you know this passage, a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, the government will be on his shoulders. Now, that, that, you said that, that relates to what you just said. I would tend to see that passage in... Chapter 9, I mean, I'm open to this, but I would see, tend to see that passage in chapter 9 as a prophecy fulfilled that I, I would take that passage as uh, being fulfilled in, uh, in Jesus, not, not anybody beforehand. Well, maybe, maybe someone beforehand too, but the, but the extent of the blessing anticipated in chapter 9 and 11. So that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I definitely see that in chapter 7, but in chapter 9, you know, the dominion will be vast and its, pro and its prosperity will never end. So, yeah, yeah. And the same with chapter 11. So it's very... Very interesting, isn't it? The New Testament picks this up. Jesus, uh, the Messiah, I shouldn't say Jesus, the Messiah is spirit anointed, right? So, that, of course, the New Testament picks up that theme big time. And when, when the Messiah comes, you have a new creation as well. That whole new creation theme that's coming. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit, and a toddler will put his hand into a snake's den. We see this in chapter 32 and 33. A king will reign righteously. He'll be like a shelter, a refuge. And again, we see the new creation, don't we? The palace, chapter 32, the palace will be deserted, the busy city abandoned. 
The hill and the watchtower will become barren places forever, the joy of wild donkeys and a pasture of flocks. Until, so here's a promise of the Spirit, the Spirit from on high is poured out on us, then the desert will become an orchard, and the orchard will seem like a forest. Then justice will inhabit the wilderness, and righteousness will dwell in the orchard. The result of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quiet confidence forever. So there'll be a new creation that's coming. And then I got my book title from this text, right? Your eyes will see the king in his beauty when these promises uh, are fulfilled. 